The next speaker is from Corian Drago about changing realities. Thank you very much. I'm going to be talking about the online world Second Life and some of the things that residents have been doing in that space. Just to back up a little bit, um, most of the core code in Second Life I was involved with writing, so when this crashes, which it almost certainly will, it's probably my fault. Also, to give myself a little bit of an out, you're actually looking live right now at Second Life, which is something I can drive the mouse correctly. So we're sitting in Second Life. This is online world. We've been live for a couple of years. We're talking to a COLA facility in San Francisco, not running locally. This is the first time anybody has seen our Linux client. We have up till now been, see, Linux client. Um, we have been up till now just been Windows and Mac OS 10 on the client. So this is something that we're pretty excited about. Um, I got the, the drop of this code in the airport at SFO before I flew over. I got this laptop the morning before I flew over. So if, if things burst into flames, um, cut me a tiny bit of slack. And, uh, and if things really burst into flames, we'll, we'll fall back to a different laptop. But we are, in fact, sitting in a virtual world. We can look around. And because you know, the only thing that's harder and more challenging than doing a live demo is to do a live demo when you do your slides in the virtual world at the same time, I figured I'd, I'd do that way. So, we're also going to try to set a land speed record and get through about 100 slides in the next 40 minutes. So when I speak really, really fast, hopefully all of those of you who speak English better than I do will be able to follow. And thank goodness you're not making me do it in any other language, because as an American, I don't speak any other languages. So all right, so hopefully here we will be able to get going. That would be a good time. There we go. All right, so we're going to start off with a, an assertion. And don't worry, I'm not going to read PowerPoint slides at you, but this, this one slide has a few words on it, and I'd like you to at least take a look at it. And what we're saying is that much as you've seen the transformation in the text space of the web and the democratization of text, that online worlds offer this same ability for amateurs to take over spaces formerly claimed by experts in a lot of different areas. And the corollary, of course, is that experts aren't going to handle this transition very well because they never do. And, and the other one is that hacking, defined as the exploration of design space, is a beneficial form of user creation. So when we look at all the user creation that you're going to see over the next 40 minutes or so, keep in mind the people doing this are all just residents of Second Life. They're all people just using the system, playing around, trying to explore the design space and see what they can do. By the way, all these images that you're seeing are being streamed in from Arcolo in San Francisco using JPEG 2000 progressive streaming. That's why they kind of res in JPEG 2000, the, the best standard that nobody ever uses. So with those two assertions in mind, the other thing I'd like you to think about a little bit, think about the concepts of play versus work. And I don't actually know in Europe whether this is so strongly differentiated, but in the United States, thanks to the Protestant work ethic that the Northern Europeans exported to us, there is this profound distinction. You are either playing or you are working, and never the twain shall meet. And clearly, that's a, a bad starting point. So keep that in mind. Also, be thinking about the concept of identity and community, something that seeing all of you here, it's clear that you guys understand this better than most people. So what we're going to do, we're going to do an overview. We're going to talk about user creation. And then we're going to hopefully talk about why this all matters to you. So what is Second Life? Second Life is a unique digital world. So by that, it's not a game. So if you've played or know about World of Warcraft, which the odds are at least many of you have, that's a game. It's, we'll talk about where that came from, but it fits this de definition of something called a more pig, or a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. And there are a whole bunch of games out there. We'll talk about how many people are playing them, but Second Life isn't that. There's no leveling. There's sort of the, no forced path to take you through. It's a very different place. The other thing that's very important is everything you're going to see from within Second Life was created by and owned by the people who made it. So, and we'll look at sort of conventional EULAs and user licensing agreements where you tend to see comments like, 
you must grant rights to and you may not and do all those sorts of things. And, and Second Life doesn't work that way. If you've read Snow Crash, the metaverse is a decent analog to what we've tried to, do, to have, have created here. A better one is uh, Werner Vinge's True Names, the other verse, which is uh, a quite a bit older work and a short story that is well worth reading. And obviously, I'll talk about it as a digital world, online world, virtual world. People use a lot of different names for these places. Nobody's really settled on one that they like. Virtual has this negative connotation, so people have tried to move away from that. But the important thing is these are places, they're persistent, Lots of people are there, and their people's action in those places matter. Right? That's why persistence is important. It's as opposed to if you're in, say, playing a first-person shooter game, where you may have a very interactive experience, but once you log out, your actions don't have any permanent impact on the space. So where do these places come from? There's sort of four tendrils that came together to, to help us um, get to where we are today. You know, the first one, obviously, you guys know more about the history of the Internet and ARPANET than I do. I do love this slide. They, you know, this was so exciting. We're moving bits between three places. Um, and obviously, where did that get to? Large-scale distributed creation by the participants and users of the space, right? I, you know, there's been a couple mentions of Wikipedia over the last couple days, the last couple of years. Clearly, connecting people equals good. The one thing that's lacking on the web, and even in the so-called Web 2.0 space, is it still isn't a place. And by place, I mean something like this, something that plugs into our millions of years of evolution to understand place. If I had asked you to think about where stuff is in your house, you could probably name hundreds or thousands of objects. If you mentally walked through your home, you'd remember all of these bits of information. If I asked you to you know, remember where all the files on your desktop are, and not including like slash Etsy, um, it's going to be a much more limited number. People don't remember flat file hierarchies and URLs very well. It's why we need search. It's why we need all these other things to help us. The other thing is while Web 2.0 is becoming increasingly interactive, the interaction between people still tends to be very sequential. I post on my blog. I say something incredibly witty because, you know, it's my blog. And then somebody else posts, and their post isn't nearly so witty because it's on my blog. You know, there's no reason for us to ever agree. There's no actual true interaction going on there, as opposed to if we're having a conversation. There are all these extra cues that we have to know why we're trying to get somewhere, why we're trying to talk about something. And then obviously non-text creation is still pretty rare. Look at blogs versus podcasts, and now look at podcasts versus you know, video uh, podcasts. So second tendril is gaming. As soon as computers were hooked together, people were playing games on them, because that's what people use computers for. So, these two dashing Brits in 1980 said, let's take Dungeons and Dragons and put it on computers. And so that was MUD1. And MUD1 begat all of more pigs, right? So the massive multiplayer online role playing game sort of emerged in 1996. It's now really the dominant form. And the important characteristics to remember is, is that it has leveling. If you've played Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeons and Dragons is all about ga gaining experience points so that you can gain level and you know, kill bigger and badder things. And more pigs are the same way. You, you, you beat up on spiders, and then you can go beat up on rats, and you know, 200 hours later, you can beat up on dragons. And so the problem is this experience-based progression rewards things like hoarding and gives value to all the things that you're collecting, which, of course, creates, when you combine it with zillions of people playing, because, of course, if you want a growth curve, you want your growth curve to look like this. And this is actually now ludicrously out of date thanks to World of Warcraft. There are 5.5 million people worldwide just playing World of Warcraft. Um, so it's somewhere around 12 million, 13 million people worldwide playing these games. And all these people want to move through the games faster, or at least a large enough percentage of them want to. So suddenly there's this big market in intangible goods. Right? So if you haven't experienced these games, you, you can get a, a sword, you know, the plus three sword of smiting. And that sword might be very valuable to other people. So you go on eBay and say, I'll, I'll sell you my plus three sword of smiting, and other people will pay you US dollars or euros or real money for that item. Back when Star Wars Galaxy, was, which is another uh, game, was going, characters that had become Jedi, which was this very rare thing in the Star Wars universe, were going for 1,000 US dollars. And even converted into euros, that's, that's still some amount of real money. So, People were using these shortcuts to move through design space faster. And the problem is, when you do that, is, is making all this content for games 
is really, really expensive. And of course, that's all being driven by Moore's law, right? Our machines are so much more powerful, we can make so much more stuff. When you look at sort of the, the content delivery, right, as you, as you see the expansion of the CPU horsepower, suddenly we're shipping, you know, multiple gigabytes on a DVD. Well, it takes time to make that stuff, and, and time is really expensive. So you look at the budgets of games, and you're now looking at budgets that look a lot like feature films in a very hit-driven market, and that gets kind of scary really fast. And of course, game companies known as bastions of efficient software development uh, take a long time to make these games. Uh, I'm obviously being facetious. Game companies are sort of renowned for being very ineffective at doing software development, doing crunch mode, and doing all the things you're not supposed to do. And you have to pay everybody while they're doing all this. And your content creation is now like 60% of your cost. So the game companies want you not to be able to shortcut your way through the game. So they set up lots of situations where you have information asymmetry, right? The game company knows the best path through the game. You don't. Well, as you guys all know, and as we learned in the search uh, talk earlier today, Lots of people working together can almost always fight their way through information asymmetry. So the big problem in games right now is that game creation costs are rising much faster than the, the market is growing. And I'm just a programmer and not a business guy, but that still seems really bad. So how they try to fight that is they fight that using copyright. And as we've seen in Europe as well as America, copyright's sort of expanding to take over all of law, right? You know, copyright is the most powerful thing around. And so they're trying to use that to stop people from buying and selling and trading this stuff. So that's sort of the trap games have gotten into. So another path was VR virtual reality. You've got Evans and Sutherland in the 60s, uh, which begat Autodesk and John Walker's amazing white paper in 1990. Where, where he sort of fused VR and, and computer-aided modeling, computer-aided design. And where we are today is, well, one, VR stuff's still just as geeky, which is kind of cool. And the second thing is we're, we're almost being able to collaborate. The, the car up there is the ME412 that Daimler Chrysler did. And what's interesting is they went from an executive doodling on a laptop to a 200 mile per hour prototype in less than a year. And they did that by doing much of their crash, crash testing, nearly all of their suspension design, everything else, in a simulated space the whole way through. But it still wasn't collaborative. If I was working on suspension and the guy next door was working on, say, the hood design, and our two parts interfered, we had to wait till a nightly check. We'd both get a notice in the morning saying there's a conflict, and we'd have to go kind of go talk to each other to resolve this. Imagine how much better this would be if we could both just jump in the car and drive around the track and talk about this is why it's so big. And of course, the other problem in building cars is you're still getting into atoms, right? You're moving from bits, which work really well, and then you're moving into atoms, which basically suck. And I, I don't know what the, the European equivalent of Walmart is. Do you guys have big box stores moving through and taking things over? But in the US, Walmart's coming in, and they basically are using economies of scale to displace small local businesses, right? And they can do this because they're dealing in atoms. The other thing you get is, is, of course, traffic, which isn't good for any of us. The final tendril here is the idea of, of social spaces. And the, the most successful version of this was Randy Farmer and Chip Morningstar did this for Lucasfilm on the Amiga, if any of you remember that amazing platform. And this was around forever. This is Lucasfilm's Habitat. A lot of people played it. And there was no hacking, there was no, there was no swords, it was sort of this social space. And a more recent version of that was Active Worlds that also sort of saw a boom and bust during the late 90s. But one of the things we lost there was in text worlds like, say, Lambdamu, and that's Pavel Curtis who made Lambdamu when he was at Xerox Park, users could actually make their worlds. And they could make interesting worlds and worlds that were cool enough that other people would want to come spend time in it. And so when you don't have that, these social spaces run into the same content crunch that games do. And then worse, they run into the problem that a lot of people come in and say, well, what, what do I do? Right? I, I understand that if you hand me a sword and there's a spider over there, I can go hack it. But I don't understand what I'm supposed to do if I'm just here with other people. So that was clearly a problem. So with Second Life, we kind of close a whole bunch of the loops of things that we're going to be talking about, and that's basically the bulk of the, 
the talk here. So Second Life launched in 2003, and this picture is sort of indicative because, so this is inside of a dance club, one of the more popular things to create in Second Life, and there are a whole bunch of people dancing, including a duck with a monkey on its back. And, and this is the kind of you know, cultural collisions you constantly get in Second Life because there really aren't any rules. Build whatever you want, create whatever you want. You know, we didn't build in turntables, we didn't build in clubs. Users just figured out that they could make those things. So why did that evolve now as opposed to off of any of those other tendrils? You know, it's basically the collision of, of consumer broadband, lots of good routing infrastructure during the boom, and 3D. And what that allows us to do is to stream everything down. So like we're seeing right now, all the content's being streamed down to us in as close to real time as possible. And we're also running a distributed grid of computers, and we'll look at that in a moment. The fact that we're running this big grid and letting people come onto it, and the land has value because we use it as a proxy for CPU usage, means that people sort of have a choice of how much they want to pay us. So we have lots of people who pay us nothing. And our top user, in terms of payment, who's, who's actually German, interestingly enough, pays us about $16,000 a month to own land in a virtual world. Perhaps more interesting is she's very cash flow positive. So she's making a huge profit doing that. And she's doing that by being a landlord, by being a land speculator, by creating, for example, German communities within Second Life. So for German speakers being able to find each other, because there are about 1,000 uh, German residents using Second Life right now. So this is sort of the growth of the world. You know, we launched in June 2003 with our 16 one use servers, and we're at about 1,800 CPUs today. So we're a, a fairly decent sized grid, and that grid just continues to grow with user acquisition. So we're doing full rigid body dynamics, and as well as a bunch of CA based and fluid simulation on a space of about 115 square kilometers. So that's, that's twice as big as my home city of San Francisco, tiny compared to, the, to Berlin, which is jimongous. Um, but what's neat about our topology and our architecture is as we gain more users and need more space, we just plug in more computers. And so this grid is just continuing to grow as we need to grow it. So if you do the math, we're, we're a teraflop of physical simulation about you know, we haven't, we haven't done the uh, supercomputer test yet because we can't take ourselves down long enough to run Limpack, but we're kind of excited to do that because we think we'll make it onto the list, which would be really cool. And obviously we're doing rigid biodynamics, we're doing Navier Stokes for clouds and wind and things like that. This is all important because this provides a world then that when people say, hey, I want to do something, it's probably going to just work because all of the building blocks are there. So we just crossed 100,000 residents, so you know, we're not as mainstream as, as some, but at 100,000 worldwide, that's, that's a fairly major number, and at 20% a month, that's nice growth that we're very happy about. More interesting, perhaps, is our demographics. Uh, games tend to skew toward 18-year-old boys. Uh, Second Life skews toward a much older and much more gender-balanced audience. Most interestingly is that by hours of use, we're about 50-50 men and women. And along any axis that you want to measure best, whether it's richest, most land ownership, most friends, most social contacts, all of the top users are women. So w women run our world. And, uh, and the median age is 35, so we skew quite a bit older as well. And what we're seeing is people bringing their real world skills into Second Life and using them there as well. So, and again, just to give you sort of an idea of scope, about 50,000 people use Second Life in the last 30 days. Um, so 180,000 different items were bought or traded between residents. So 180,000, I mean, that's a lot of different things. And that was in 4.8 million player-to-player -player transactions. So they're making a lot of different things, and those things clearly have value because measured by the internal currency, there's a value of about 4.5 million U.S. during that month, and 400,000 of that was traded on open markets for real U.S. dollars. Right, so $400,000 between 50,000 people in a month. And there were 75 million IM messages because people obviously like to talk to each other. So how do we achieve all of that creativity and creation? Well, you, you can do the math probably better than, than I can. But when you have 60,000 user hours a day and a quarter of that time is spent making something, it's like I had a 2,700 person content development team. Which if I had to pay them, it would be $270 million a, month, a year, which clearly I'm not doing. Instead, they're paying me to, to use Second Life, well, paying us. So 
I have more people writing script code than Debian has contributors. So it's interesting because we plug into a lot of the same community aspects that open source is so successfully leveraged, but we allow people who don't know how to write code to still contribute and participate. And that's been really exciting to watch and really exciting to talk to our residents about. And so remember this whole ownership status quo, games don't let you own anything. Second Life obviously is different. We do let people own what they make. We do grant people rights to what they, what they own. So they, own, they, you know, they have their IP rights. And there's a whole separate argument about whether digital items should be intellectual property. The, the, the perhaps unfortunate reality is that currently in US and European law it is, so we can or have that discussion separately if anybody wants to. We also allow people to obviously buy and sell for real US, or for real money, which again is very different than most of the games. And in fact, we've already seen some examples of people licensing their content back into the real world, and we'll talk about some of those examples. So, What's all this about an inevitable transformation, right? Well, we've already seen on the net that there's this clearly an ability for radical decentralization to allow a lot of creation, right? The net's, net's really big. And, and all of this was enabled by saying, look, here are some basic protocols, go to town, we're gonna let you go do what you want, we're not gonna try to govern this. There isn't gonna be some massive central authority stopping all this. And obviously there's value both in the creation itself and in the networks that are being created. But the, where it gets interesting is what happens when you take that same sort of power and say, okay, let's move out of just text, let's move into 3D, into experiences, into everything that you can do in a virtual world, and let's make it all real time. So we introduced the concept of sort of atomistic construction. So of course, <laughs> People make guns, they go into a virtual world and one of the first things they make is guns. That's probably a sad commentary on the human existence. But, if, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but that gun's actually broken into about 40 primitives. It, so individual small objects that were manipulated in real time. So when the guy who was building this gun was doing it, someone else could have been helping and standing nearby and saying, hey, do you want this texture or maybe you want this script? And so, and this gun sells for about four US dollars, just to give you a, a kind of an equivalent. And the, the, the person who made it's a grad student actually in computer science and it hasn't paid his tuition yet but it's covered his, his books and his beer which for a grad student can be pretty significant. So, again to differentiate this from sort of the places that have come before, in the game Ultima Online, this is how you made a piano. You took all of these random things, and I'm not, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but it's, it's you know, a checkerboard and shirts, and you kind of stack them. And you end up with something that sort of kind of looks like a piano, right? And so this was, this was a piano in Ultima Online because people wanted the decoration of a piano. But this has very few of the signal characteristics of a piano. It only has the appearance. So one of our sec Second Life residents made a piano in Second Life, and of course, you can actually play it. Every one of the keys actually plays a sampled real piano sound. So you could use this piano to entertain at a party, you could compose a symphony on it, you can use it for all the things you could use a piano for. You could even have a, a sexy avatar dra draped across it if that's you know, sort of your fancy. So this is a really big difference. This is creation versus sort of crafting, which was the traditional game version of this. And what's interesting and what everybody told us sort of four years ago was that, well, these are really hard problems. People can't make 3D objects. People can't make good looking people. And people definitely can't write code, right? These are you know, some of the most traditionally hard problems in building interactive experiences. And just to give you some orders of numbers, right? So there are around 100 million 3D objects that residents have made up to date. They've made about 10 million different characters, avatars. There are like 30 million lines of script code that have been written, and about 10 terabytes of user content total. The, uh, the Nota Bene is kind of cool in the bottom right. It's a resident who noticed that there was no notary in Second Life, and you'll probably at some point, when you're thinking about this, start asking questions like, well, is there government, and, and how do you do that? And, and obviously, we're not gonna be doing top-down governance, so what's happening is the residents are trying to create themselves, and so, one of the things they did is he recognized that you, know, you can't have, for example, mediation or dispute resolution if you can't prove what the agreement was. And so using our scripting language, he did 
uh, secure key signing. Of course, our scripting language didn't actually run fast. It took like seven minutes for it to, to process a, to sign it. So then he switched to transmitting the data out of Second Life to his own computer, signing it there, and then transmitting the data back in. Because we allow a lot of connections back and forth to the real world. We, of course, hired him almost immediately. One of the great things about having a world where people write code is it's a, it's a great testing ground for potential hires. So basically what we've seen is if you give people these tools, they're going to go do all sorts of crazy stuff. Now, all sorts of crazy stuff inevitably includes unanticipated consequences. So these two guys decided that Second Life, like any world, clearly needed alien abductions. So they made these two aliens in a spaceship and they started flying around and abducting avatars. And they, <laughs> they, they, were really, they were really clever about it because what they did is they'd only do it about once a week for a while. And so you'd have these people posting in the forums, I was abducted by aliens. And of course everybody's responding, <laughs> No, 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 you're just stressed, you know? And, you know, clearly you need to get more sleep. And, uh, and so, and it was great too, because they gave you a t-shirt, you know, I was abducted by aliens and anally probed and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. And, and so, you know, these are the kinds of things where there's no way a priori you're gonna decide that your world needs something like this. And when you look at the evolution of the web, it's full of these moments. And when you look at Second Life, it's the same thing. It's occasionally rather terrifying to be, run, to be the, you know, on, on our side of all of those, but, and we'll actually look at one of the more destructive ones. So let's look at how user creation has hit all of these different areas. We've seen a lot of what I'd call traditional media imported into Second Life. So like the Metaverse Messenger, they actually do this gorgeous layout in a PDF file. And we tend to print them out and leave them around the office because it's just a beautifully laid out newspaper. Um, the Second Life Herald is kind of fun. It's a, a philosophy professor from University of Michigan who his idea of role playing is to role play as a curmudgeonly sort of yellow journalist, right? So muck racking, making up stuff. He would claim to not make up stuff, but he makes up stuff, right? And that's sort of his role playing. And so he's constantly doing these incredibly incendiary articles and accusing us of stuff and that's sort of his role. And he's actually got kicked out of a different online you know, game for doing the same thing. And in Second Life, there are definitely days that, that it's not my favorite thing in the world to read what, what Peter's writing about me. But for the most part, it's pretty funny. And you know, that's his method of playing. That's his method of enjoying the world. Um, and the New New World Notes is a blog. We have an embedded journalist who's been with us since very, very early on. And, and he basically writes as if he was writing for sort of a small town newspaper. And it's kind of interesting to see as we get to 100,000 residents, the number of real news stories has gone up a lot. There's a lot of very interesting, interesting news happening just among our residents. So a different form of communication, memorials. The upper left was for the London bombings. And this was an international group of residents came together immediately and, and wanted to do that. The bottom right was for Katrina after it hit New Orleans. And this is something that we've seen in Second Life, other online worlds have seen this as well. What makes Second Life unique is the ability for people to really be, to explore what a memorial means and to make it whatever they want it to be, to not be limited by sort of the rules of the game. A, a small aside, so games have a concept traditionally of the magic circle. Um, the best example of it would be hockey. So when you're playing hockey, you're allowed to you know, hit people and knock them over and get in fights. Behavior that in the real world would be assault, battery, get you locked up in the pokey. So, but the courts have traditionally respected the fact that if you stay within the rules of the game or the rules of hockey, they're gonna say, no, 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 you're just playing the game and everybody agreed and it was consent and da, 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 da. So there's a big debate among games and online worlds about whether they should be connected to the real world. And one of the things we've seen with Second Life is well, so all games have seen that no matter how much developers try to not connect them to the real world, everybody does. Because at the very least you have a communication connection and there's usually also an economic connection. We've seen in Second Life is by actually encouraging this connection, people doing all sorts of really crazy stuff. So the upper left was the Second Life community convention. This was a group of users that in 12, I think it's 12 weeks, organized a 200 person conference in New York City for Second Life residents. 
They did it all without ever meeting. They did all the organization inside Second Life, and they included streaming video, which you're, on this screenshot, you're seeing a person inside Second Life watching the streaming video that's being streamed into the virtual world. So if you have all the metas there correctly. Um, and so, and they did all this, completely organized it. It was one of these things that when you were at the conference, you had to look around and go, there's no way this could have happened. I, you know, I'm sure that the, the CCC feels the same way, that you, know, you get these incredible group of people together, and you're like, how did this actually all, all get pulled off? Um, the bottom left, I don't know, did Mystery Science Theater ever come over to Europe? Do people know what that is? So MST3K was a US TV show where they'd play really bad movies and then mock the dialogue. And it's actually, I'm sure you've done it with your friends, right? You're watching this really bad movie and just start mocking what's going on. Well, it turns out that if you can stream movies into a collaborative space, you can sit up with people from all over the world and mock bad movies, which turns out to be a lot of fun. And so that's what people are doing in the bottom left. They're watching, um, you know, there are a lot of public domain movies on the web from like these really bad 50s, like how to, you know, American how-to films, like how to be a good son and, you know, a date with your family. And so they're really fun to sit around and just mock for the, the values that they attempt to, to pass along. Another good example of blasting through the magic circle, so Cory Doctorow, who's a sci-fi author, who I'm sure many of you have read, he releases all of his work with Creative Commons. So a bunch of Second Life users made readers for his book inside Second Life. Well, what do you do then? Well, you clearly have to have a book signing. So Corey came into Second Life and did a book signing. What he would do is he'd sign pieces of paper, he'd then take a, a, a picture of them and upload them into Second Life because you can upload textures. And the people would then add the texture into their book. So the bottom right is somebody who now has a signed digital book of Cory Doctorow's book in a virtual world. And the cool thing was seeing the line that was stretching out because given that you can be, be basically everything, you had everything from completely normal looking avatars to you know, giant walking robots walking up with their book, please sign my book, you know. And, um, <laughs> and, and Corey, Corey really gets this stuff. He actually wrote a, uh, a short story on his game or on his game that we talked about the economic future of some of the things that can happen in these places. And of course, what was fun is he was writing it fictionally for sort of the future, and basically everything he wrote about has been happening in Second Life. So the idea of being able to collaborate with multimedia sources in a shared space, right? This is, this is sort of the holy grail of you know, teleconferencing and all this stuff that's really, really hard to do in the real world, and our residents have been building all of it in Second Life. Um, like the one on the right is this Infonet. It's, it's a shared network running inside Second Life built completely by users using the scripting language that we know nothing about. Passing information around and they, they talk about places to go and things to avoid and, and it's so good that we've actually put up Infonet kiosks at all of the new user arrival areas because it's better than anything we could have made. So, and obviously Second Life isn't a game but there is a great deal of play that goes on there. And the bottom left is, is a really cool example. So Tringo was a game made by an Australian programmer um, over sort of his Christmas holidays. And it, it swept Second Life, and he made, he made like 5,000 US or so you know, in Second Life. But more interestingly, he actually licensed the rights to Tringo to the real world, and in January it's gonna come out on the Game Boy Advance. So you have a game that was completely written and tested inside a virtual world that's gonna be sold on a Nintendo portable gaming product in the real world. And he's the one who got all the money for it. We had nothing to do with it. So, thinking back to this trap that games are getting into, when you look at the power of user creation, this starts getting very interesting. Because you start seeing this enormous potential for people to really go and explore the design space of games in very cost-effective ways because they can leverage the creation that everybody else is doing. One of the other things we've seen is a lot of what we, we kind of loosely term real work in Second Life. Um, and this is everything from both UC Davis, University of California Davis, and Dartmouth have done uh, disaster preparedness simulations using Second Life because it's so much cheaper for them to build mock-ups in Second Life. And when you're doing first responder training, one of the most important things is figuring out, well, where do I stand, where do I walk, where do I put the box of medicine so I can walk around it? And when you have physically modeled avatars, you can do all that. Having, and if they had to build the system from scratch to do all that, it would have been enormously expensive for them to, to try to do that. And then, of course, we also see the, the inverse. We see people moving out to the real world, their businesses in Second Life, everything from clothing creators, uh, people selling land, 
there is a, an ad company that has sprung up that's, that they've bought all this land in Second Life. They have these you know, signs that rotate ads that track to see if there's an avatar nearby looking at them and they count that as an impression. Um, and they track it all in a database out, out in the real world. And you know, who knows whether it's going to be successful or not, but it didn't cost them very much money to try and they're having a blast doing it. The other thing you see is a lot, much like the memorials, you see people are very generous with virtual currencies. I think to some people it's just poker chips. They don't think of it as real. And, um, and the American Cancer Society, um, they do a very big uh, yearly event called Relay for Life. And so they actually, did where you, uh, you as a participant, go out and say, hey, will you contribute this much money per mile that I run? And what's interesting is they did a Relay for Life inside Second Life. So you had avatars running around a track who had gone out and got pledges for how many laps they'd do. And they raised thousands and thousands of dollars US doing that. So, and they're actually, uh, American Cancer Society is actually moving to have a more permanent presence inside Second Life because they really see charitable giving in online spaces as very much a future direction for them. And so this kind of comes back to this whole play versus work dichotomy. And I guess the only thing is, you know, 40 hours a week at McDonald's or some fast food joint versus the guy in the lower right. The guy in the lower right was a homeless musician who, while staying with some friends, figured out that he could stream audio into Second Life Live. And so he started playing at a jazz club inside Second Life and started earning enough money to pay his friends who he was staying with. So which one of those is play and which one of them is work and which one of them has certainly more social redeeming qualities I will leave as an exercise to the listener. So again, we kind of go back to this whole bits versus atoms discussion is that when you stay virtual, you have a low or zero marginal cost of reproduction. That means you don't have to deal with traffic, Walmart. The same economies of scale don't apply. The same thing that we're seeing with digital distribution in other media forms, you're now applying to all sorts of things in Second Life. Oh, unless you think that all these bits are just going to stay bits forever, I, I highly encourage you to read Fab by Neil Gershenfeld. Uh, the work they're doing at MIT with Fab Labs is incredible. This is the idea of how to build anything. Um, and in fact, um, the, the radar dis discussion from the previous one where he needed this, this very complicated mechanical thing built, he should probably just go to eMachine Shop or Squid Lab because if you give them a CAD file, they'll machine it for you. Um, but the idea that, that Neil has done is that you can take like $20,000 worth of, of equipment, drop it into a third world country or a disadvantaged area, and have kids start building every, everything from really complicated mechanical stuff to integrated circuits. And remember how we were talking about supposedly hard things like 3D modeling, people, coding? Well, guess what? You drop the right tools in front of kids, they go, this, so what if this is supposed to be hard? It's fun. And they go to town, and before you know it, they're actually building useful and interesting things. And what they found is when they drop it into the third world, the kids are there first, but then the adults come in and start saying, well, I actually need a, a moisture sensor for my farm, or I actually need a tracking system to track my flock up in the mountains. And so they start using the same tools to build really interesting things. And obviously, the, the emailing of a design to a fab unit, we're, we're just about there already. In the next five years, we'll definitely get there. So the other thing to remember is because everything is collaborative in this space and everything's happening in the same shared space, you can take advantage of the most powerful learning model, which is peripheral participation. What that is is the best way to learn something is to just be around people who are experts. Right? It's, it's in fact the whole purpose of Linux user groups, right? And any other, I mean, you know, so for my era, era it was Atari user groups, right? It was to get together and sit around the, the people who were really smart and watch what they were doing, and that's how you learned. And it turns out that when you're in a world where everything's collaborative, that's what you can do. And in fact, because we haven't crashed yet, I think it's time to live on the edge. So let us pop to a sandbox. So sandboxes in Second Life are sort of public building areas. Uh, we, we sort of wipe them, uh, I think, twice a day. But sort of anybody can build there, and you never really know what's going on. But what you'll find when you get there is usually a lot of people sort of sitting around. Plywood is sort of the default texture when you first make something. So when you see large pieces of plywood, it's probably because people are experimenting. You can kind of see people are building everything from whatever this weird structure is. 
Uh, it, it's, it's something, I don't know what it is. Um, and it looks like it has a radar tower on it, so it fits in with the last talk, that's good. And, um, and this is, you know, pretty typical, and, and it sort of ebbs and flows. We're actually at a pretty low point uh, usage-wise uh, during the day. And let's, let's really live on the edge and see whether we can suck the map down. This will be, we'll use a lot of bandwidth here. The whole use more bandwidth, we'll, we'll take care of that here, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna suck down sort of the Google map of the world and you can see all the green dots are people. Oops, let's, let's only see the green dots. So, again, lest you think that I'm cheating, this is, this is the live world. You can see where people are. People are clustered out on, um, the areas out in the water we call private islands. Um, these are people who want to have a little bit more control. Maybe they want to zone more carefully. Because the, the mainland that we own, we don't really zone, so people you can have you know, a castle next to a total Bauhaus structure next to, you know, a dance club. And some people decide they want to have, you know, more, pri more zoning than that. So let's pop back here. And actually the, the, the slides that we're showing, this, this was just built using the same tool set that you used to build things in the world. There's just, one of the places you can attach things is in a reference frame relative to the camera. So all the user, anybody could do the same thing. So peripheral participation leads to amateur to amateur behavior. And by amateur, I don't mean not good at it. But what I mean is not sort of an acknowledged expert, right? You know, 99.99999% of the, the Linux community would be termed amateurs in a lot of ways because they have some other job that's their sort of real job and then they're contributing to the open source community. Uh, the bottom right is another interesting um, punch through the magic circle. This is a life drawing class in a virtual world. What people do is they put up an avatar, people draw it in the real world, they scan it, they upload it into Second Life, and then they comment on each other's life drawing skills. And that's turned out to be a fairly popular activity. Again, something that if you'd asked me to predict what are the things going on in Second Life, um, that would not have been high on my, my list. And then we've had a lot of conferences actually done inside Second Life. Um, the upper left is, is a future salon. They do monthly meetings, they bring in guests. And they have people from all over the world come in and discuss and meet the guests. The guests give lectures. Um, they're really fun to go to. Uh, the bottom left was Make Magazine actually is selling Make Magazine inside Second Life. And we're starting to see people really closing the loop of going from a place in the world to, you know, basically a Flickr knockoff Snapzilla that a user built that allows people to organize their Second Life snapshots. And then Rome is a search engine where they built these bots that go out and scurry around the world gathering data and report it all out to their, their database and then they sort of do a Google index search into, into that. And because you can spawn Second Life off of an URL if you've installed the client, all of their links, you just click on it and then you launch Second Life and you arrive at that location. So, um, and you'll see sort of our next steps are gonna be closing that loop even tighter. And Oh yes, there are a lot of schools using Second Life, just take my word for it, rather than waiting for the text to resonate. There are about 200 ed educators and researchers using Second Life. One of the other areas we've seen is, is therapy. Um, so there were nine severely physically disabled people on cerebral palsy who had their caregiver taking them into Second Life. And when you then read their blogs talking about their experience of interacting in a virtual world where for a long time nobody knew that the people behind the avatar, well, that A, that it was more than one person and that B, that they were severely physically disabled, that this had a profound effect on their lives. You, when you read about them talking about this was the person I always thought I should be. Um, there's also a program in Portugal where abused teens are using Second Life both to get comfortable in social settings again, and to learn programming so that they have a leg up when they start going back to school. And we've seen stroke survivors also organizing groups. Um, and this is a running a little short, I'm not gonna actually go there, but the, the Wild Cunningham, this group that, of cerebral palsy victims, the next thing they did is they built an area inside Second Life to teach people about cerebral palsy and other neurological disorders. So this urge of once they were in a world where they felt able to do all of these things, the first urge they had was to then educate others, which I think says something very powerful. Another big research item that happened um, in Second Life was this virtual hallucinations. They, um, at UC Davis, two medical doctors did extensive interviews with um, 
with people suffering from hallucinations. They then built the hallucinations in Second Life and took caregivers and family members through, right, in, through this virtual schizophrenia to be able to talk to them about what the effects were. And the really interesting thing, if you're a researcher, it took them a couple man weeks of development time to do this, cost them virtually no money. And they had 900 survey responses because they had residents going through it and filling out this as well. So if you think about how hard it is to get people to actually go through an experience like this, Second Life offers some really interesting research opportunities. And I'm gonna actually skip ahead. They're also um, a group of Asperger's sufferers. Asperger's is a, another neurological disorder that affects your ability to interact at a personal level. So they built areas in Second Life where they had the chairs set up at the right interpersonal distances so that when you engaged in a conversation, you knew how far away you should sit from each other. And again, these were then things that people took back into the real world and talked about, wow, I'd never felt in control of a, in a, of a conversation before. And we're gonna skip that one. People playing with Boyd's and AI and sort of everything you would expect. Basically, the, um, secondlife.com slash education takes into the sort of research and education side. Like I said, there are about 200 participants right now. We're becoming sort of a de facto clearinghouse for research information on virtual worlds. And it's a really good place to link up with other researchers who are um, playing with the space. Come on, streaming. There we go. Um, and so what's so key about this, right, and this is, is something that you guys all understand is that user creation and, and, and exploration helps drive you know, this, com this community of practitioners, this community of learners and, and experimenters. And this means that you're surrounded by other people whose first thought when they're exposed to something new is what can I do? What can I do in this space? How can I play with it? And that's really powerful and it's something that when you talk to educators is really lacking in the real world. It's not something you, you get easily. And of course, after you figure out what you can do, you then experiment and see, well, did the idea work? If not, why not? How do I optimize it? And what's great from a building this community you know, standpoint is this looks a lot like science. And there's a whole separate argument about where science fits into culture and everything else, but clearly practice thinking critically is useful. It's just like you'd attack a debugging problem and it's something that is very hard to teach and it's something you have to practice because we're in a world where all of this is becoming more and more technological. You have more and more information flooding at you. How do you judge the quality of information, the value of information? And of course, skipping ahead to a problem that's particular of the US, what happens when you don't practice critical thinking about stuff? So this was a, a survey on, on evolution versus creationism, something that isn't as big a, an issue in Europe as it is in the US. But you can see that the, the little thin blue piece is the, is the percentage of U.S. residents who believe that humans evolved. The rest is some version of a creation story. Um, and so, not, not that you guys should laugh at Americans too much because I could have put up a slide about homeopathy or some other things. So, clearly when we don't practice critical thinking, we're very easily taken in by information of dubious quality. So, and of course, in my mind, Hacking is exactly the same thing, right? Hacking is what can I do? Obviously, I'm making the common hacking, cracking distinction. I'm not saying what can I do and how can I destroy things necessarily. Um, and of course, it isn't always easy to embrace this. When you have, you know, 2,000 CPUs, full user scripting, physics simulation, there are lots of ways to attack Second Life. So gray goo attacks are sort of the most popular one right now. So you can see in the upper left-hand corner a bunch of a bunch of crazy balls taking over the world. In the lower right, you can see what we did. We put up a fire break. We actually took down a whole bunch of machines, isolated the attack, and then went in and cleaned it up. And, um, and of course, the traditional response when you run a service that people come in and attack is you take, you have this really cool feature that users really, really love, but it enables some kind of really naughty behavior. And so, of course, what you do is you nerf that feature. And so, and, and this is sort of the traditional approach here, and it's the wrong one. And it's not the one that we're gonna make. It's sort of like, there's a set of answers that are always wrong, right? DRM, right? There is no question that DRM is the right answer for. Um, and there, there are certainly others that fit into that. And, and merely nerfing the inconvenient features, 
is probably not the right answer. And when you look at the evolution of the internet, it's the same thing, right? Clearly the decision to keep it open is a good thing. It's embracing this exploration. Here's a resident who, who made a, a, a exercise bike way of pedaling his way around in Second Life, right? And now he's getting interest in it from people because uh, games for health is a really big issue in the US right now. And so this is embracing people trying to do these experiments now, not fighting them, not working against them. So what are we doing to make this all better for everybody who wants to hack on Second Life? Because that's, everything up to now is sort of where we, where we are. And so I just want to do a couple of slides. Hopefully if we, if we stream in, there we go. So what we're doing next, um, the two screenshots there are an open GL port of Firefox uh, running. And uh, for anybody who's tried to embed Firefox in open GL, knows that that's sort of an adventure. It's the reason Minimo has sort of been stalled. Um, but it's now working and it's done. And we're going to release the, the, the demo app of that back to the community um, in probably the next couple of weeks. It, unfortunately, I'd hope to be able to, to hand out the URL now, but the, the guy who is, did all the work and is hosting the web page where it is is on an island sunning himself. He's like, I don't even have a phone where I am, so please don't give out the website yet. So if you're interested in hacking on a OpenGL, Firefox browser, uh, email me, Corey at secondlife.com. I have a unique internet name. I'm very easy to find. So that's going to be in the next couple of weeks. The next two things, or next three things, um, we did a homegrown bytecode engine. We're switching to mono. And including in that our improvements to mono um, are things like microthreading, suspension, ability to do um, move processes between different mono virtual machines on different computers. And all that code is going, to be, is going to be obviously given back to the mono community. We just started testing of that, so that's sort of a Q1. We'll, we'll enter real testing there. So obviously what that enables is people to bang on us with more than just our scripting language, which is really cool. Well, and it runs a lot faster than the written in one night bytecode engine. Um, so what you're seeing obviously is our, our client is just about ready to go out in Linux. Um, if you want to be on the compatibility testing, alpha testing for that, again, email me. Um, because the more people we get piling on it early, the easier that's going to be. And then the other thing is, you know, we have instant messaging in Second Life. Any idiot in hindsight would say, well, you're using Jabber, right? And we say, oh, gosh, no, we aren't. So a big process for 2006 is going to be switching as many of our systems as possible open to, over to open standards so that other people can plug in, scrape the data, play with the data. Because, you know, this is where we're going. The future is you want the only limit to be how creative the people using the system are. And we're part of the way there. We want to get the rest of the way there. And frankly, folks like you are going to be a big part of driving us there. So if you want more information, secondlife.com is where it is. It's free, by the way. So if you want to pop in and poke around, you can. You only have to pay us if you want to own land in the world, if you want to have permanence. Uh, Terra Nova is an academic blog that there are a bunch of both European and American writers on. And then New World Notes is our embedded journalist. And I'll leave this slide up so you can catch the URLs. Thank you. We have about five minutes for questions. If anybody has questions, otherwise, I'll be around. So. Yeah, hello. I had a question. Um, a few years ago, over here. What? A few, a few years ago, I heard about a project where uh, you could buy a, a cow for a village in Mozambique for something like 25 euros. It was a French project. And it was like a virtual pet for the person who bought it. But uh, it actually brought a cow to this, these villagers somewhere, yeah, somewhere it's, in Africa. Yeah, it's Heifer International. It's still around. And um, I just wanted to bring that up as an example, uh, as a way to, from a, from a gaming culture, to export some kind of social praxis into the, what, into the world as you described, the atom world. Well, and and you, you brought up a lot of examples of like educational things and, and really good examples, but I was just, Wanting to, one of the disturbing things about gaming culture to me is that the thing that it exports the most is an economic factor or some of the 
so, sort of old world hierarchical structures. So uh, actually Heifer International is a good example. So I talked about the fact that people are very giving of virtual currency. Uh, the second major donation that came out of Second Life was actually to Heifer International and it was like 2,000 US dollars that they had raised in a month specifically for that. So I think that's a great example. Kari, um, I would uh, like to ask you, <clears throat> um, what about changing the economic uh, or political system inside Second Life? So you don't have to conform to any political or economic system if you don't want to. Some people, you know, in a world where you can do anything, you want to avoid option paralysis. So the reason that Second Life intentionally looks somewhat like the real world is we wanted to provide a context. A second context for a lot of folks is the earn money. But not everybody does. There are a lot of people who have no interest in earning money and there are a lot of, there's actually at least one project of people who are setting up areas where they're making their own constitution, they're saying here are the rules we're going to live by. Uh, one of them, it's actually called Neo Altenburg and it's set in sort of a, I, I think American interpretation of what a Bavarian village would look like, but it's, it's you know, snowing and peaked rooftops and everything and, and they're, in, they're in the middle of their election campaign. And so there are big signs up for the Social Democrats and it's just, it's, they're really enjoying it and they're, they're taking it very seriously. If you want to live there, you are agreeing to live by their local rules. Um, how did you solve the denial of service attack, for example, with the balloons you showed us? So the, the gray goo attack, which is sort of one, the, the current popular flavor of attempting to take down the system. Generally, we, we try to control those by making sure that you may be able to take down an individual machine, but it's hard to take down the world. Um, we are continuing to give landowners and people in the world more ability to stop an attack or respond to an attack if they see it. And, you know, in the long run, it's local control, right? It's, it's in many ways just like if you're getting DDoSed in the real world, you know, you have certain responses and the more local control you have, the better. Yes, people fly by me. But, you know, when it comes right down to it, you use, you know, technology when you can, but you then also use social pressure, you use laws, but you don't want to take away the, people, the ability for people to do interesting things just because a small minority of people choose to use them in malicious ways. All right, thank you very much.